Um, what a lovely introduction, wow. Um, I think, I mean, I, I need hardly say that it's a real privilege and it's lovely to be here. I haven't really been back to Ireland much since, since I taught here in my youth. I taught not here, but in Dublin. Um, and it's just wonderful to be here and, and thank you for coming. Um, and this is going to be fairly informal. I, I'm going to talk a bit first about just about my background and how I met Valerie and the particular problems that her work presents and the particular excitement too. Um, and then I thought we'd do some hands-on stuff. And it's not all, I mean, you don't have to know necessarily to be working um, with French to be able to follow, at least follow what we're doing. And some of it you won't need French at all. So um, I'll need to know, I mean, it would be helpful to know some of your backgrounds as well. Um, the, I called it The Art of Drowning, and, and this is from a postcard that Valérie sent me once, which was this, which I keep on my dresser in the kitchen to remind <laughs> me not only um, about drownings of self, but also about drownings of anybody else. Um, can, can you explain what that means? Oh, Noyade yeah, Interdite means no drownings. No, no drowning, drowning alone. No yes. <laughs> or drowning <laughs> forbidden. Yeah, drowning forbidden, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the point being, I think, I mean, I, why I coined it as the title for this is that when you translate, you have to drown something. You know, you can't, when you're translating a poem, um, you, the, the meaning, the way in which words mean is actually quite complex and you can't save them all. So you have to kind of prioritise. You have to, it's a bit like the sort of kidney machine exercise or the life boat exercise to begin with. You have to decide what is less important to the poem, or you have to try and decide that um, almost before you start. Um, okay, so I mean, I think it's, it's decisions, really, which are all important, maybe even more than, it, you know, huge knowledge of the language. Um, th so, I mean, I don't know, it's, it would take an awful long time to go around everybody and ask you all what your backgrounds are, especially when you probably know each know one another, so it's, it would be mainly for my benefit, but just for interest, how many people don't really, aren't really working from French or don't know French in the room? Can I, a show of hands? School French. All right, okay. Basic enough. Yeah, <laughs> and, and how many people have already tried translating poetry from French? Yeah. Right, and how many people have translated poetry from other languages? Yeah, so we've got a, a scattering, uh, right, so so most people have some working knowledge of French, so that's that's helpful. We have a number of Spanish colleagues who would have some French, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay, that's yeah. great. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight into where I'm coming from, I, I was, I think now, quite lucky in that, I mean, I went to a school I absolutely hated, which was a grammar school, um, but it did have one good thing about it in that it was in Kent, it was very close to France and it had an amazing French exchange system. So from the age of 12 I was going every year for a month to France and um, you know I was one of the lucky ones because they had a big group going to Compiègne, a big group going to Tours and then there were four students left over they couldn't find places for, so they eventually found families in Paris for the last four. And I was one of those four, and, and, and that made a big difference, I think, somehow. Um, but I was very, very shy, so when I went, I, I was sort of crippled with shyness to the point of never speaking any French, but when I came back, I suddenly found I could speak it if I tried, and I, and I, could, I could certainly understand everything that was said to me. Um, uh, so anyway, I, I haven't, I'm not, you know, I haven't got any kind of formal qualifications in translation. I, I did a first degree in French. I did a PhD at Sussex in French, um, and I did I did French with Swedish. So I, I mean, I do have two languages really. Although well, I haven't done much in Swedish. <clears throat> um, I just I I haven't translated regularly either. I I just. Um, did a poem here and there for fun from time to time and some of them got seen by someone and there were some Apollinaire I did that Christopher Reed saw in England and put Robert Chandler's way and they got an anthology but um, not much more than that really. Um, but I guess people knew that I was interested in the language and, and you know that I was a potential 
candidate for work in French. And the thing that started me off was in 2004, I got invited to Paris um, to the uh, Festival Franco-Anglais organized by a guy called Jacques Rancourt, who's Canadian um, and lives in Paris. And, and this was my baptism of fire, in a way. Um, there, were about, there were about ten of us, yeah. nine. Um, four, there were four or five um, with a native language of English. There was one Irishman, there was, one, there was me from England, there was an American man, there was an all poets. Um, Two from Australia. Yeah, one from Australia. John, John, John Mathieu. Oh, was he there? That the young guy. Oh right, yes. There were two from Australia. Um, <laughs> then there were the, the French ones. There were there were two or three. There were two uh, from yes. France, two mm. from Paris. There was a Serbian writing in French. Jean no, no, not Serbian. Kurdish. No, from mm. um, And then there was a Quebecois poet. And we were all invited to put short poems in weeks before. So we sent one poem, and that poem got translated by the people working in the other language. Um, and then we came together for, I think, four mornings mm. in this little basement room with no natural light. I still remember it very fondly. And we thrashed out our different versions of the translating the same poem. So we'd been translating the poems in private. And we'd come together to, with the poet there to talk about the translations. And it was absolutely extraordinary. It was really absorbing. And, and that's when I met Valérie. And she gave me her book. And the book absolutely knocked, knocked me flat. It was just an amazing book. I just, I thought I've never read anything like this. Impossible to translate, really. What a pity. Um, and then I started playing with it and tinkering and, you know, doing it like a crossword, just as one does, you know, not sort of beaten by it, sort of carrying it round in my head. And eventually I kind of just amassed a body of translations somehow, and then we corresponded a lot and talked about them, and it ended up being a book. And, and I feel, again, very privileged to be able to do that. Um, but that being said, I had, at certain times in my career, I had considered translation. So I had, there was one point when I was thinking of translating seriously, and I kind of went to the University of Kent, I think, and came back absolutely laden with theoretical books on translation read my way right through them. Um, but I didn't, I and mean, I expect you've all done that. If Those of you who are studying translation, I ex I'm sure you have much more theoretical background than I do. Um, but I did, I mean, it did make me firm up some of my beliefs, I think. Um, one thing I met very firmly, which I, was surprising, seemed to be the idea that one head was better than two. That when you were translating poetry, the kind of um, integrity of a single vision was likely to, to yield a better product in the end, something more coherent than something shared. And in spite of the pleasure of sharing and doing it together, I, I thought, yeah, this makes sense, really. And, and it's obviously easier if the poet is dead. <laughs> um, but failing that, you have to find a poet who is very, very generous. <laughs> and I did. And Should I disappear right now? <laughs> you were wonderfully generous. So that, that's, I think, if, if the translations I did is successful, it's largely to do with your generosity, really. No. That you, yeah. Anyway. Um, the other thing that seemed to be argued about a lot is whether one even needs to know the original language, the, the source language. Um, and of course, as a linguist, I mean, I would firmly say, of course you do, you know, it's absolutely, it's a travesty to, to, to use a crib and make a poem and call it translation, you know, you know what you're doing isn't translation at all, really. Um, but then you read something like Robin Robertson's Transturma, and I have to say, I think it is excellent, and okay, he's, I, think, I believe he's got a Swedish partner, but... Um, you know, I, I said to him once, you know, because I, I did Swedish, I said, oh, you know Swedish? And he said, no, no, I don't know any Swedish. Um, and, you know, this seemed, it seemed um, brave, really, to, to, to be able to take that stance and say, yeah, I don't know the language, but I'm going to, 
take a crib and, and work from it maybe just as humbly as if I had been working from the original and making it and seeing how the poem works and making it work again in, in my own language. So I'd sort of half take that on board. Um, the other thing that I was very interested in was this statement, which I'll read you. And I can find it. Um, yes, this used to be, I mean, they don't, they've changed it now. They don't use this one anymore. But this used to be um, the original ARC series editor's note in the, in the first... Um, Arc Visible Poets books. So it was written by Jean Bose Beyer, who is still the series editor. And I think it's a very intelligent statement, but one I have been wrestling with for a long time and I'm not sure whether I agree with. Um, so I don't know if you've met this before, probably. Um, I'll just read it, it's that paragraph. There is a prevailing view of translated poetry, especially in England which maintains that it should be read as though it had originally been written in English. The books in the Art Visible Poets series assume that the reader of poetry is by definition someone who wants to experience the strange, the unusual, the new, the foreign. Someone who delights in the stretching and distortion of language which makes any poetry, translated or not, alive and distinctive. The translators of the poets in this series aim not to hide, but to reveal the original, to make it visible, and in so doing, to render visible the translator's task too. The reader is invited not only to experience the unique fusion of the creative talents of poet and translator embodied in the English poems in these collections, but also to speculate on the processes of their creation and so to gain a deeper understanding and enjoyment of both original and translated poems. Um, I mean, I used to think I was not on that side at all. I used to think that I really did want it to read as a poem, as if it had been written in English. Um, and now I'm, I'm slipping back a bit the other way, and I'm not quite sure how I feel. But I think... I think it's not exactly distortion of language that we're after. Um, I'm not sure. It's strange. But I mean, I think it's, it, it was a thing that, that haunted me and, and that I had to think about a lot. And I've never come to a satisfactory conclusion, really. Um, but what it does make me, what it did make me think, was that the idea of the is after day, you know, the idea that... Um, you could prettify the poem by departing from the original, really. And um, that either you were faithful to the original, you know, and you produced something which was maybe less poetic, or you took liberties and you arrived at something perhaps which worked better in the target language. And I think very firmly that that is a false dichotomy. I mean, I think you see that everywhere still. Um, and I think it's not taking into account um, the idea that everything in a poem is meaningful, really. It's, it's treating meaning as if it were just the semantic properties of the words themselves, something you could find in the dictionary. Um, whereas, in fact, there's meaning set up in the patterning and the, and the changes of tone and the changes of, you know, the connotative qualities of the words quite as much as what they denote. Um, so, anyway, um, what I think is really... Um, that a poem is, is a pattern made out of language and if you're not paying attention to the pattern all you're left with is language you're not left with the poem really um, and so I really think the first step is to read the poem closely and to work out what that particular poem's priorities are and, and almost to make a list of you know, what this poem is doing and therefore what you've got to prioritise when you, when you translate um, I, don't, I, I, I envy you who are, who are studying translation because I've never actually been taught any, you know, I, I, I don't know what the received message is and maybe you've heard this to the point of, you know, maybe you've had this up to here or maybe you've heard the opposite and I have no, no idea really. Um, but I also think that, 
you know, you have to respect the poem's priorities and that the idea of any idea of form against meaning is also seemed to me old fashioned even in the nineteen seventies, nineteen sixties, nineteen seventies when I was at Sussex. Um, so, you know, I'm not that somewhere I'm not going to go really. Um, I would naturally try and respect the form or or do some equivalent, make some equivalent gesture. Um, but also, I mean, yeah, there's a, a project I saw, now I think this was coming from, I can't remember where this was coming from, but recently it was mooted that on a website, um, someone should set up a kind of translation matrix to allow children, to school children, to come and decide which word they wanted and to translate which word with. And I thought that that sounded an impossible thing to do, really, that it's not about, you know, choosing the best alternative for a word, word by word, really. Um, because I thought that, you know, the idea of verbal equivalence in two languages is a bit of a myth anyway. Um, because, especially in poetry, they don't just denote, but the connotations are all important. Um, they also bring in a whole baggage of usage and frequency. Um, and, I mean, especially in French, I think you notice that the Latin-derived words are a great temptation, because we have many of the words we have in English. Um, and they look the same, but they're not the same. They're almost false friends, really, because they they don't carry the same connotative baggage. Um, and we, I mean, we were very firmly taught this as undergraduates, and I'm grateful for that. That when we were doing a, a um, doing a translation into English, um, you know, don't go for the word that looks the same. You go for the the word that that is richer in your you know your speech. Um, and you find this, I mean, you, you think of something like enterré, um, you know, and then, you know, you could say inter, you think of the difference between inter and bury, um, and the difference in connotation if, you, if you're writing it in a poem, and, and the difference in, in temperature between those two words and the baggage they'd bring. Something, something like, you know, mastiquer, masticate, and, you know, I won't go further than that. And so even something like pejoratif and derogatory, you know, you ask yourself, how often is pejorative used compared to how often is derogatory used? How often is derogatoire used compared with pejorative? You know, and it's, it's the, the reverse. So I've come to think that a thesaurus is as useful for a translator as a dictionary is, really. A dictionary is useful. But a thesaurus will give you not just lots and lots of ideas, you know, especially when words are getting harder and harder to find as you get older. Um, but it will also give you ideas about words with the rhythm you think would fit in your line. Um, so you're, you know you're searching for a word that means so-and-so, but it's you know, got to go da-dum, or it's got to go dum-da-dum, or something. And, and a thesaurus is really, really helpful for that. Um, so, yeah, I also do bear in mind, I think, that reader expectations are very different in different countries. I think they are, and I'm not sure how much, you know, how, whether that should count or not. What, what brought that to a head for me was trying to translate a sequence of poems in Swedish. Um, where the, each poetic sequence was made up of a tiny, I think it was two-line stanza, and each in Swedish, each was on a separate page. And I thought, would any British publisher even approach this project, you know, having a book that was virtually all white space with a tiny little thing, you know, and it just makes you think about what the cultural norms are and whether, you know, you've got to, you're dealing with the whole real world, really. It's not just a mental construct, it's a physical thing. Um, anyway, then the second part of, of this that I was going to talk about a little bit is that Valerie's poems are very, very difficult. <laughs> to Not difficult to hear, but difficult to translate. Because there's such a lot going on inside them all at once. 
Um, and I really like that. I, I, I guess I did bring out my kind of crossword solving persona to do it. Um, but the words often mean at least twice, if not three times. So there are lots of puns in her poems. Um, and sometimes the puns are sort of flagged up by being misspelled, so that what you're reading on the page, I mean, they're not exactly misspelled, but that's the way of flagging up the pun. Um, so, for example, I don't know whether those of you who came last night, there was one poem that had, No, Not a Laughing Mass. Does anybody remember that? Um, and it was Pas de mes Mesquinerie, and it's hyphenated. So, you know, when you're reading it, you think, what? You know, that's, that's the first <coughs> reaction. And it, it means, you know, mass which does not laugh. Um, but it also means sort of pettiness, small-mindedness. So, mesquinerie is, is one word, um, you know, is not problematic. But it's spelt in such a way that you cannot ignore the pun. And you've got to try and get those, either get those two meanings in somehow, or failing that, at least get some sort of punning gesture in that, that balances it somewhere else to, to make the poem um, a punning poem in some way. Um, but, I mean, there's quite a lot of that. Um, there's another thing, I, I bet there is a name for it, and maybe you will know it, um, but the syntax is often um, fluid or bivalent, so you have a phrase that ends in a word, and the same word, only printed once, begins the next phrase. Do you understand what I mean? Um, have I got, I don't know whether I've got an example of that, I probably have. Um, yeah. Yeah, I can't, yeah. um, yes, no, I haven't, um, well, it's, it's about three or four lines, and by the time I've explained it, I, it's not going to be useful, so I'll miss that out. I'm afraid you'll have to take my word for it. Um, yes, one of the puns I particularly liked um, was, again, one we read last night, um, was the ending of the poem, poem for Jacques. Does, does anybody remember that? Um, which ends, Un cri d'esprit, une flèche, zaoum. Jusqu'au ciel insensible carquois. And the carquois, um, it's about an arrow, flesh. Um, carquois is written for what? But of course it means quiver. It means a quiver full of arrows. So you've got to get in those two different meanings. Um, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of that. Um, so there's the, the syntax, the fact that it's so fluid is helped by the complete lack of punctuation. Um, so, you know, you, you have to reckon with that on the page. Um, there are lot, there's a lot of very idiomatic French reference to proverbs um, and, and sort of... Uh, slang. Sorry, slang. slang. Yeah, the slang, the child speak sometimes. Uh, language in different registers, different languages, you know, there's at least English, Italian, I can't, um, can you think of any, any other languages you use, Spanish. Um, so, you know, you meet a chunk of English in the poem and what do you do with it? You know, you've not, I mean, you don't need to translate it exactly, but you've got to somehow flag up um, that it's in English in the original. Um, so all this is, is complicated. Um, Can I ask a question? Yeah, I do. Why, why do you not do it into French? Well, you do if it works. Yes, you can do. Yeah. Or, but I, I, I often, I couldn't necessarily find a way of making that particular phrase work, but I put in another bit of French to compensate. Um, yeah, I have done some of that. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yes, one of them is... Um, Mon avion est délayé. I mean, my plane is delayed. Right, that's the original. So, délayé means, I don't know if any of you cooks, yeah, diluted, you know, you dilute a sauce. Um, so, you do my, I don't know, my plane has been diluted. <laughs> yeah, and then, 
I don't know. Then, then what you do? Mon avion est... I mean, you, you lose the pun. If you put that in French, then you lose the pun, don't you? Hmm. I mean, you don't want anything with the dandy or whatever you would say. I don't know what's... Well, it was snowing and... Uh, yeah. Oh, I, I was homesick. Yes. I, and I, I lost any English. So uh, I put the English into French. Well, the words were English, but the grammar was French. <laughs> yeah. I was lost in yeah. translation, lost in translation, lost in I wanted to go home and the, the, the plane wouldn't... Ah. Yeah, well, it's diluted. <laughs> Tony yeah. had left me, you know, I was mm. all alone. Mm. No French people around. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I'm going to break off at that point and then we'll do something practical, but does anybody want to come in and, and talk about anything or, or throw in comments or argue with what I've been saying, which I'm sure is is probably quite a sensible thing to do. Any thoughts from anyone? Should we, I, well, what I thought we would do, just to give, I think, a, a, a taste of what it's like, really, I thought we would look at a poem that's written in English, um, Irish English, um, and somebody Irish who read it, like Matthew, <laughs> um, and try and prioritise what we assume that we're translating it into our other mother tongue, um, whatever that might be, and, and think what in this poem would we really like to save, and if we have to jettison something or somebody, what, what is it going to be? Right, so I chose a poem that I'm sure would be just about as testing as one of Valerie's, only, only longer. Um, so we've got it. We've got it's, in the, it's in the handout, it's the last poem in the handout by Paul Muldoon. <coughs> The birth. Before I read this, if I was faced with this to translate, I would hang myself. You <laughs> do? You would be wrong. <laughs> the birth, seven o'clock, the seventh day of the seventh month of the year. No sooner have I got myself up in lying green scrubs, a sterile cap and mask, and taken my place at the head of the table, than the windlass woman, women ply their shears, umbrella grub for a footling foot, then warming to their task, haul into the inestimable realm of apple blossoms and chanterelles and damsons and eel spears and foxes and general hubbub of inkies and genets and kikapoos with their memnis or peekaboo quiffs of Russian sable and tallow unctuous vernix into the realm of the widgeon, the who, or yellow pole, not the zuzin, Dorothy Eva Coralitz Muldoon. I watched through floods of tears as they give her a quick rub a dub and whisk her off to the nursery, then check their staple guns for staples. All right, thank you. Well, I thought it might be useful for everybody just to try and write a list of the, the passengers in this particular raft that you would want to save. Can I do that? What characteristics of this poem for you are absolutely crucial to the meaning of the poem? The whole poem is based around a child's alphabet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I imagine you could do some equivalent in your own language with that. Because I'd say the words themselves are not strictly relevant. All right, he's trying to yeah. do is bring up the world. Yeah, yeah. So that's mainly in stanza three, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Really, although you've got the whole alphabet. Um, I think the, might, the X might be missing. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. About vernix? vernix no? Oh, vernix, yeah. I suppose. Yes, yeah, yeah, so although yeah. it's not, yeah. It's, not, it's there, but it, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, so I mean, if you look, that's an extraordinary stanza, isn't it? Because some of the things are ordinary and you would want, and they do mean in, in the normal way, like the apple blossom and the, the vernix, I guess, and the Russian, Rus the peekaboo quiffs of Russian sable, um, widgeon. I mean, some of them are a lot less obscure than others, mm -hmm. and some of them are so obscure mm -hmm. 
that nobody is likely to know them really. I mean, I was trying to get my mathematician husband to explain what a lemnis was, and he looked it up in his mathematical dictionary, and we, between us, we couldn't come to a successful e explanation. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that the, their meaning is ultimately obscurity. Um, but it's only one obscure word, and the poem as a whole is not obscure. Mm -hmm. You've just got to reproduce that level of obscurity, I guess, in, in one or two words, just to give the feeling that the whole world is encapsulated in this birth. This birth, this child is born, and suddenly, wow, there's this whole, you know, the whole alphabet, the whole world has come through in, in terms of what can be known and what can't be known. I, I mean, I just jotted down ideas that I thought I would like to keep if... And the things I wrote down were joy, excitement, liveliness, skipping, wonder, strangeness, variety. Um, you know, the, it's, it's similar to what you've already said, really, but that the, what's being evoked is a world, but it's a, it's, it's a wonderful, strange world. And as you say, the obscurity that the child kind of, it's all full of magic, but the child doesn't necessarily have understanding of it all. But the sound as well, isn't, isn't the sound important? The sound, yeah. You've got, yeah. especially in stanza two, you've got a lot of alliteration. Yes. Yeah. you try and... Try, try and go for that. Right but the grallop, grab yeah. the wing last woman, grallop, grab a footling foot. That's Hopkins, I mean... It's yeah, almost, yeah. I mean, it's only for one stanza, and then he, you know, he, he kind of is out of there and somewhere else. Yeah. So you've got to protect those changes of tone mm -hmm. from stanza to stanza as well, if you could. And the rhyme scheme is amazing if you go down through the, the end rhymes. You know, year, sheer, spear, yeah. scrub, scrubs, hubbub, rub-a-dub. Yeah, well, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, no, yeah you so you have, yeah, yeah, so every stanza is, yeah, is doing that. Yeah. So I guess the unevenness of the lines, you wouldn't necessarily have to break the lines exactly when they're broken, but you could break them with some leeway to, to get your end word where you needed it, to get the rhyme that you needed. Yeah. And if you were doing that, Susan, would you try to keep the... Would you try to replicate some rhyming? Would you in your in? The yeah, I'd try. You'd try. I'd try, and yeah. then if it didn't work without strain, then you that would be one of the things I I, I guess I'd jettison. Um, another thing I would try and protect is the third stanza beginning with that word, sudden, or beginning suddenly with the apple blossom. For example, if you had that in French, you know, you had something like "voyons inestimable" or something, and you split it after "voyons." It wouldn't work. You've got to begin that stanza on on the word that counts to take you out into a different place. And then you've got another change of tone at the end. It's full of cliche that last stanza. And watch through floods of tears and give her a quick rubber dub and a whisker off to the nursery and then the ultimate pathetic line really mm -hmm. check their staple guns for staples. Moya d'interdit, flood of tears. Well, I suppose so, yes. <laughs> like in Alice mm. in Wonderland. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean you, you comes down with a bump at the end and you've got to protect that tears. bump. You've got to not make that poetic. You've got to not succumb to the temptation. But aren't the staple guns quite fine as well? They are, yeah, yeah, they are. Yeah, actually. The shears that are mentioned. Yeah, they the are. Yeah. 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 Instruments but, of destruction. Yes. Yeah. But they're different. The ply their shears, because ply is archaic. Yeah. The ply their shears are in a different world from staple guns. Yes. And is it the umbilical cord or the three fates? Yeah. I mean, two things. Uh, yeah, you don't know. But I mean, <laughs> yeah, so it's a real juggling act. I mean, you would. What, I mean, what would you let go? You wouldn't be able to do all that. I mean, I don't know, I don't know whether, whether there have been translations of this and how they've got on. Um, I wouldn't like to do it, as, as Matthew was saying. I mean, the thing to, I mean, I've done this poem in workshops in this university. Oh, have you? Uh, I say to the students, this is an extraordinary work. Mm. Because, and it has to be extraordinary to work. Because the hardest thing of all to write a poem about is the birth of a baby. 
It's so corny. Mm. It's so cliché. There are so many millions of shit poems done on that. Mm. And this is a brilliant mm. poem. Mm. It's brilliant because it explodes everything. Mm. And then I say to the students, don't, don't jump into the river, Lee. Don't worry, you'll never be able to write something <laughs> like this. I reconciled myself a long time ago. I'll never be able to write anything. I'll just get on with what I can do. Yeah, yeah. Or you could keep trying and fail better <laughs> each time, as they say. <laughs> as he said. Um, yeah, anyway. Um, I, I mean, I think it was something of that that I, I felt when I was faced with Valley Lee's work, really. It's as, as experimental, as a revolutionary, and as potent. I mean, because this is an emotive poem. It's a, it's a, you know, in some ways it's experimentally confrontational and it's odd and it's unnerving, but it is, it also does genuinely evoke the excitement of a birth, I think. And that's very, very hard, as Matthew said. And, and when, when I was reading your stuff, it was real emotion that was coming through of that kind of, that kind of verbal playfulness, that mm. level of verbal playfulness, but real emotion. And that, that for me was extraordinary, really. Does anyone want to say anything? I mean, do you think this would not be worth approaching or um, should we all shoot ourselves? Drown, rather. Metaphor. But, but I say, I mean, just because it is the, the alphabet, you know, and you couldn't try to substitute words that began with the A, B, and C, but it, it would sort of seem to suggest that there was, that would seem to imply there was a randomness in what he picked, that it wouldn't really matter, you know, that, that, that presumably it isn't the case only, you know, like chanterelles, you know, he's big into mushrooms because he was in a mushroom farm. So, so, you know, they all kind of matter and have certain resonances, and it must be very hard to get words that are both beginning with um, the right letter and have the same kind of flavour, you, you, you know, uh, given that there is, um, yeah, that, that, part, that some of them really matter and some of them are random and it's probably hard mm. to know what, um, which ones are, so I suppose that, that part seems particularly challenging, I mean it could be kind of a different, very different even if it might have the same flavour because the words would describe different physical things. Yeah, it could. Yes, it could. And and I, you would it would be a balance. You would have to choose, and every translator's version of that would be different, because some of the words you would find easily, and some of them you would probably not find at all. And you would decide which ones were going to be the the transparent, really evocative ones, and which ones were going to be the the puzzling ones and the strange ones, and, and they might not be the same. And, they, and you might be doing violence to Muldoon's pantheon, but I don't think that matters that much. I think as long as the poem survives, as long as the mix survives, if mushrooms are important to Muldoon, I don't care, really. <laughs> um, you know, I... No, no uh, uh, that, that's true, but, but, but the, the other words, though, because those might be private connotations for him, but, you know, something like damson, or, you know, they would have yeah. some kind of thing about the fruit and the taste, yeah. or, you know, which... Yeah would be hard to replicate when you had to pick a word between mm. D. I don't know whether you could change the order of, you know, whether you could make some of his ones appear because they began with a different letter, you'd use the K for, for the L or whatever, you know. But yeah, I'm sure you could. could. That. That, would, that would be a hanging offence. Uh, this is the, in the order of the alphabet. No, no, but yes. I said that, but what I meant was that, let, let's imagine that the French word for dances began, began with P, yeah. but then when you were slotting in the P, you yeah, say, well, okay, I'll put that yeah. in there, yeah. and, I mean, yeah. it wouldn't work yeah. all the time, but you might yeah. get a few of them in. But on the other hand, then, the first line, you have four kind of foodie things, whereas at the end you're into birds, the yellow pole and the witch, and so they, yes. they kind of group a bit. Mm. That seems to yeah. And did he speak French? Does he speak French? Paul Meldoux. Does he speak French? I think yeah. he does, yeah. Because he uh, writes with much mushroom and um, Meldoux, mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> no, but chanterelle is the same word in French. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if I were to translate into French, I would give this very word because you hear chanter, sing, and mm. he yeah. sings his daughter. Yeah, chanter, and. Chanterelle. Mm. It's, it's yeah. wonderful. It has to be. Yes. Mm. Yeah. 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 It's, it's like a poem, but it's not. But it's like. Mondain's French is very mischievous. He says, un fleur mauve comme le ciel. And everybody knows le ciel is not mauve. La terre est bleue comme une orange. Yeah. Yeah. 
Anyway, um, shall we go on and look at one of Valerie's? Um, I've done this and I hope um, nobody would feel the slightest bit um, patronised by the fact that I've done a crib on this because I didn't know what the, the level of, of your linguistic knowledge would be. Um, but so I've, I've done that. I've, there are two little poems here, two well, brief poems from Parvoir um, with um, my not very, not particularly, well obviously not polished at all really, um, English crib. And I thought it might be fun to, to try and work out what you think is important to the poem in French, if you can read it. Um, and then and then just try and get a fair version um, and see what we come up with. Everybody happy to do that? Or are you all feeling knackered already? That's fine. Yeah. So you've got it. So, um, Valérie, do you want to read the poems in French? Yeah. Ma mère prend mm -hmm. la photo. Ma mère prend la photo et puis elle a 20 ans. On ne voit pas la voiture verte pour aller partout. Toujours sourire, ils traversent le petit pré et ils voient les premières fleurs. Ils ont un enfant, chacun dans les bras, les mots qu'ils aiment se disent deux fois. Soleil, soleil, sur l'herbe, sur l'herbe, tu danses-tu Le ciel se danse, parfois le soleil juste en face. Je prends son vélo à mon père, en vitesse rayonnant comme libre. Cadre d'alu, vache légère, plateau pour leur panse montgolfière, toujours librement des rayons. Mm, thank you. Um, I think one of these is much more difficult than the other. Mm. Mm. And I think um, maybe you just choose which one you'd like to wrestle with and have a go. Um, disregard my crib entirely if it's, if it's not needed. Um, and if it is needed, make it into something a bit more graceful without doing violence to the original. So should we take, what, about a quarter of an hour to have a look at that? Um, so... Did, which one did most people choose, or have you done both? Did most people choose one? second one is more challenging. Second the second one is more challenging. Yeah. Who, who went for the second one, just for interest? Both. both. I tried yeah. both so um, let's look at the first one first, because I think it is much easier. Yeah. But even so, there are, mm -hmm. there are areas of ambiguity and, and difficulty, mm -hmm. um, which we can complain about to the living. <laughs> um, so, uh, what would you settle on as difficulties before we actually hear what people have put? What, what, what do you think is challenging about this one particularly? Nothing. Well, there, there seem to be like connecting words missing. I suppose you know it, it's not normal syntax or no, it yeah. isn't. Yeah, no. I mean the the first strangeness I think is in in the first line, the et puis. Yeah. Um, my mother takes the photo and then she's twenty. I mean the, it's it's sort of upending your usual logical expectations, isn't it? Mm. Um, so, I mean, you want to reproduce that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I would want to reproduce that. I think that that kind of disorientation at the beginning is, is doing something. Matthew's shaking his head. Well, you, you, you say what you think. No, I, I, when you want me to read what I've gone, I'll do it. But I won't talk about it in the okay. abstract. Okay, well, read what you've got then. My mum's 20 and is taking a photo. The green getaway car can't be seen. They always smile when they see the flowers in the meadow. They each carry a child and chant their favourite words 
Sun, sun on the grass, grass, are you dancing? I love the getaway car. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else want to, to say what they've got? I didn't notice it. a much less interesting word is runabout. You know. <laughs> for yeah. Very, yeah. Mm. You thought you thought of runabout. I didn't do that point, but I thought of runabout. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I that was one thing I put past you because I thought runabout too, and I um, asked you if that was okay. I remember asking you in an email if that was okay, and you said, "Yeah, go for it." Um, runabout. You know, the green runabout to run about in. Mm. Um, because you can't reproduce the alliteration, really, of what you're about. I don't think. Um, yeah, the next problem I, I came across was toujours sourire, because that's very ambiguous. Mm -hmm. It could be, you know, that they're always smiling, there's mm -hmm. always a smile, or it could mean, you know, oh, they're you still, always have to smile, they're, they're still, still smiling. smiling, or, yeah. you know, we use um, how to keep smiling. Um, so it's got all these. And that's the photo, you know. Yeah, so oh you yeah, have to keep saying yeah. cheese. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what did anybody else have for that line? I'd now say, say cheese, but. Um, you possibly, if, if it is the idea of sort of always having a smile, it could be something like say cheese, but it would cut off, you lose lots of the other meanings, I suppose. Yeah, you lose the smiling meaning then, mm -hmm. really. I think that they're always, you know, the idea of constrained smile is, is quite interesting, do you think? You should, yeah. you, you should yeah. come in here, yeah. you should well, say it's, more. It's not very constrained, but um, my parents were very, very young. Mm -hmm. and, uh, my mom was 17 when she had me, and when she had number two, uh, Stefan, um, she was 19. That's why I am, it, it was quick, every two years I had a new bro or sister, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was as if, it, as I felt it, it was quick. That's wh why the first line is, she takes the photo, we are two kids, and she's 20. And mm. when she is 21, there's number three coming. Mm. <laughs> and then mm. when she's 22, mm. my, my first sister and number four, etc. Mm. Mm. Seven children. So, so really, the sense of you so, is not so, uh, yet 20. But it, the problem with this book, it's, it's not a collection, it's a book. So um, it's like a kind of novel in poems. Mm. So it's as if you had a just a, a piece of a whole. Yeah. Mm. And Part it's a real problem even to translate like this because either you translate the whole book as you did so, or people try to pick pick out, you know, a, and, and it's, it's a whole sequence mm. yeah. of 78 poems. And they, I, I wrote 400 poems for this book mm. and kept 78. Yes, it was wow. very big, um, yeah. but uh, much shit, she, as you say, yeah. <laughs> many shit poems. But, but, uh, <laughs> but it's about the death of my father. Yeah. So uh, when he died, he was young, and it reminds me of it reminded me of um, happy souvenirs. And the, the car was green because uh, oh, we, we lived in the country, and it was to hide. Mm. It's less camouflage. Yeah. yeah uh, Je n'ai pas pensé à la littération voiture verte. Elle est verte parce qu'elle est dans l'herbe et qu'elle est bien cachée. It's more important uh, than the. So it, it's two V's, but uh, it's well. It's because it would be green car would be like to work. Would work. Toujours sourire. You have to smile. I think you have to smile would have the constraint of, in the picture and also you've got to smile, you know. Well, it, it was probably um, my, my brother Stefan uh, was a difficult baby and it was very hard to have a smile. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was mm -hmm. always crying. And yeah. When he was born, I, I bit him very hard. <laughs> I was jealous. <laughs> 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 
Yes, because the, because, the because syntax is completely fragmented there, and that itself carries a meaning in a way. If you look it's it's a, a, in fact in fact I should say it's for my parents. It's their springtime, mm. and we are the two first kids, first two kids, and that's why the two. It's one of my favorite words too. Mm. Um, um, soleil, soleil. Sur l'herbe, sur l'herbe. Et tu dans tu is a bit uh, far fetched, but it's tu tu. What you wear when you're oh. dancing. Oh. <laughs> oh. Okay. Yeah. So, but but you, you can't translate that. that. <laughs> it's just that. Yeah. So, so. Can I but ask a question? Um, did you know all these biographical <coughs> details that Valerie's just been saying? Not when really. No, I've, I've gleaned them over the years, but I don't know whether I knew the whole picture when I translated the individual poem. Um, Next question is does, does the translator need to know all these things? I hope not. No. Not really. No, I hope that the, that it, the poem is, exists in its own right and is setting up its own resonances and questions. And well, it's, it's linked to happiness. We yeah. had a happy childhood. And that's a, this kind of poem you, you learn in France when you're a kid. Mm. Uh, le bonheur est dans le pré. Cours y vite, cours y vite. Le bonheur est dans le pré. Mm. Cours y vite, il va filer. And uh, it's here, the mm. petit pré. Mm. It's like a, a tiny paradise. Yeah. What word did so, people have for pré? Did you go for meadow or field or? Yeah. I just said field. Field, yeah. yeah. But meadow is, yeah, meadow is a bit poetic, a bit poetic I suppose. Yeah. Although yeah. it's closer. Yeah. Really yes, cool. it is. Yeah. yeah. You have pre in our shop, mm. I suppose. I like meadow. Yeah, meadow is a nice because word. Because I, I grew up in yeah. Donegal and they used the word meadow in an mm. actual way. They yeah. talked mm. about the meadow. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. Thank you very much for taking this. Thank, thank you. Early kids wishing us Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I think you have some latitude in the last line about which exactly which words you're going to repeat in English, which is, is rather nice. It's rather a nice choice to be left with, you know, especially with the two last two. It's a long line, running on three. Mm. Mm. Does anybody else want to read what they've got for that, for the whole thing? Anybody... Daring, you're <laughs> very quiet. I'm not used to classes that are so quiet. I don't know. Yes, that might be nice. Yeah. 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 Tenían cada su crianza en el cobro, las palabras que aman, dinse dos veces. Sol, sol, sobre la herba, sobre la herba. Ti, danzas ti. Mm. On sent que les langues sont plus proches. Hein. Yeah. Mm. Oui. Tout de suite, c'est plus. Oui. Beaucoup plus proche. Oui, oui, oui. Que l'anglais. You can hear it's the same poem. Yes, yes. 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 It's, uh, I recognize my poem. <laughs> <laughs> What about the second one then? This is uh, this is um, this is the ultimate challenge I think in that mm -hmm. first book. Mm -hmm. The one I found beautiful. Oh, I even mm -hmm. I looked up um, Vash because I couldn't quite you know believe um, that. You know the, what? What my senses were telling me—that it was about cows—and obviously, vash is a very normal word. And actually, I mean, I, it, I, uh, in the dictionary, it said vash meant a special lightweight kind of water bottle for taking on bicycles or something, absolutely incredible. And I ran this past Pallini, and she said, "Oh no, I didn't know that." <laughs> so, you know, and it is actually cows. But I mean, you know, it shows how you, how you get in the world. You don't quite trust your own reactions, you know. Um, I don't know where I found that, in mm -hmm. some technical dictionary somewhere. Yeah, because it's linked to my father's favourite sport, le cyclisme. Mm -hmm. So um, it's difficult for that if you don't know this, this sport. Um, because um, there's an expression, um, 
monter en danseuse. It means you, um, you know, in Tour de France, the races, um, uh, the champions uh, pedal. They are. Um, uh, <laughs> they're they're you know, they, are, they don't have. They yeah. don't sit on the. Yeah. And it's it's called en danseuse. So we have tutu and danseuse. Sure. Yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> In two different poems, it's uh, just. I think the part that would be your ass out of the saddle. I remember this. And the plateau, you know, when you change, uh, <coughs> when you change the vitesse. Yeah, change the vitesse. Yeah. Change the vitesse. It's plateau. Yeah. And plateau is where the, the cows um, ruminate. It's fierce. Yeah, so it's the, 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 the plane, yeah, the plateau, yeah. It's polysemy. Yeah, but it also means gears, mm. yeah. Mm. It, it's the plane as in the flat field, sort of, is it? No. Well, you said it was as well, didn't you? Uh, no, it, it's uh, le ciel. It's uh, there's a, you have to when you have to to. This is the word plateau. 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 Oh, plateau. plateau. Ah yes, the plateau may be flat. It's flat. Yeah, yeah. yeah, but you you have also the gradient. The gears. The gears. Yeah, the gears. Yes. Yes. The round big one. Yeah. But what does the, which does the plateau mean? Does it uh, can mean both. That's when you change that's gears. The point. Yeah, that's the point. The plateau means gears. In French, it means it's working both. in two ways. Yeah, it means both. You have to change gears, and you you ride on a plateau, which is a, a piece of a piece of ground when it's flat. Yeah. You change gears because you had to first you climb and you are yeah. en danseuse. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's me on my dad's um, bike, bike, which was very uh, expensive bike, a crazy thing, uh, uh, on aluminium, which is the lightest bike mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. very best um, champion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. Anybody would like to read <laughs> their version of the second one? So, Indeed, it's it's difficult. This one is it's, it's very difficult. difficult. Yeah, it's very short and very. Yeah, long. but on the other hand, there's, it's in a way it's low risk, you know, because you know you can't you can't do a perfect job. I don't see how you can really. So you yeah, you I, try. You Mary has one. Have you? Well, I, I yeah. have, but it's mm, it's very poor, I think, and it's not getting any of the effects of the original really. But I I mean this is uh, just for what it's worth. <laughs> The sky is dancing with itself, sometimes the sun right in front. I take my father's bike from him, speeding, shining as if free. Chrome frame, light cows, plateau for their hot air balloon bellies, rays of sunlight, still for always. And what I just imagined was oh. somebody grabbing their father's bike and <coughs> hopping up on the bike and pedaling along mm. at f and seeing all these things, the sky, the sun, you're feeling free. Yes. But I, I mean, that was just my immediate reaction. Yeah. 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 Actually, um, the word grab would be very good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Because it translates and balloon be belly is very good. Balloon belly. Mm. Yeah. So because you have belly. the joy of, yeah. of pedaling. Mm. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, first line, uh, it, I hear it's... The sky can be danced. Yeah. That's what I meant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, the sky yeah, like can be danced, danced with the, with the bike. Oh, the bike is dancing with the sky. Yeah. That's nice. It's not with. Uh, it's um. True. True. Uh, yeah. Uh, the use of pronominal verbs for passive meaning, Mary. Mm -hmm. Is the use of the pronominal with the passive meaning like uh, like, like le livre se vend. Uh, mm -hmm. I know. I know. So you I can just the sky around. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 maybe the sky and the sky maybe. Yeah, Something I really like. You, you dance like a, le tango se danse. Mm -hmm. You can dance even with the sky. You can
I really Hopefully. liked your speeding shining. I thought, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, in the end, sometimes when yeah. you do it by take, by using two words, yeah. where the yeah. French is so economical, they only use one. But if they're the yeah. right two words, they, yeah. they can work. Yeah. But it's a it's an amazingly difficult poem because everything in it has two meanings. And the mm. rayon, it's the you know les roues de, du vélo. Are yeah. called rayon. Oh, the spokes. Like, mm. the, yeah. spokes, like uh, yeah. the sun's rays. Yeah. It's the yeah. same it's word, the same in, word yeah. in French, yeah. Mm. So, um, and rayonné, it's my, yeah. but it's, it was a mm. previous poem. But, mm. and, yeah, yeah. but all these yeah. poems are linked in Paraguay. That's mm. why it's difficult mm. also yeah. to, they have to be translated yeah. in echoes yeah. with each other. Mm. So, mm. Yeah. 78 mm. poems. And yeah. when I finished, the, I had almost 400 poems. And I kept, wow. I kept, yeah. Have you still got them all? No, no, I, I throw them in the garbage for recycling paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, those I kept, those mm. are published. And um, I kept, I um, <coughs> um, put the manuscripts, each poem, to order them properly because they were not written in the order mm. of the book. Mm. 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 So, Mm. Well, the ordering of the book it itself is a, a very interesting phenomenon because it comes, in, it jumps around in time, it's and yet it seems yeah. sequential. It's it's kind of seems to be narrating in order the psychological experience mm -hmm. while is. jumping about in the, yeah. the place in the narrative. Yes, it's wonderful. And is it the case that the poems are trying to bring back something of the joy that the father represented yeah. as a young man <coughs> and, and for you when you were a child, that there was something kind of joyful and magical about him, in yeah. a way? Yeah. And the poems are trying to capture that. Yes. Mm. Yes. yes. Yeah. Mm. Could I try, just having suffered through, could I try with you by one yeah, version yeah, of the second yeah, one? Yeah, please. I, mean, yeah, I, I, I won't even apologize, that's my idea. Um, uh, the freewheeling sky, sun blinding then not, I whip my father's bike, putting on speed, all for free, metal body, oxen of the sun, ballast for their hot air bellies, the sun spins its spokes. Very good. That's lovely. Yeah. That's lovely. Yeah. But free meaning was in fact the exact opposite of what it meant, but I didn't know. That. Yeah, there were some really good things in there which yeah. I didn't jot down in time. Can I hear it again? Yeah, please. Um, the free wheeling sky. That's great. Sun blinding, then not. I whip my father's bike, putting on speed, all for free. Metal body, oxen of the sun, ballast for hot air bellies. The sun, ballast, spit, it? Ballast. Ballast, yeah. the sun spins its spokes. Mm. I mean, I think that's beautiful. Mm. I think that's mm. really got real exciting yeah. energy and it works. Yeah. But I yeah. think it's slightly farther from the, the French <laughs> than I would dare go. <laughs> yes. But I mean, yeah, but then, it's the same yeah. um, concentration. Mm. And yes, yeah. yes. Mm. But then you have, you have the dilemma of, you know, when it's printed in parallel text, now how do you regard the fact that it is in parallel text, do you, I mean, part of you, most of me, 80% of me, feels really grateful that the original is, is there and preserved for people to see where I've diverged, that I'm not doing anything to, you know, if, if I've kind of <coughs> veered slightly away from it, that, that it's visible that I've done that. Mm. I think that's good. And then the other half of you kind of squirms and thinks somebody hostile is going to look at this and say, mm -hmm. how did she dare to do that, you know? So you have mm. these two conflicting reactions, and, and most of me is, is just very grateful that, that your poems are there, and mine's like a kind of, um, I don't know, gloss on them in a way. Um, mm. and, then, and then half of me kind of winces. Well, not half, 20%. <laughs> so, yeah. and, and do you worry about this distinction that people make between translation and version? That you know, there seems to be the suggestion that the further you go from the original, the more it it becomes a version rather than a translation. Yeah. And do you see yourself as trying to stay with the activity of translation and making what you you produce a translation rather than? Version. Or I do, do you, really? Yeah, I mean, I do, do, do because I'm a linguist by training. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I, I'm trying to stay as close as I possibly can, and I, each time I realise I'm not, I feel uneasy. Um, yeah. But at the same time, I'm not willing to sacrifice everything. I'm not not willing, you know, I, if I can see that something is going to kind of activate the poem in the way that the original was activated, and that I can't achieve it by by an absolute verbatim translation, then I would diverge. Mm. But yeah, you worry all the time, you worry about it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think? I mean, you know, you're teaching poetry translation, what's the received line, you know, on all these things? Is, is the one <coughs> these days? I, I think there there isn't. I think it's changing a lot now and that there, there are different views, you know. Mm. Um, but I, I do think the person doing the work has to choose in a way. They have to make mm. a decision. Yeah. Uh, mm. But um, I, I'm very persuaded by the idea that one keeps something of the strangeness of the activity of translation. Mm. That, that, that what you produce is in some way marked mm. by the not just by the, like you're bringing another culture into yeah. your own culture and there's something a little bit strange about that, but that also the, the, the piece that you have produced has a feeling of strangeness in some way about it. But the, it's a very... Yes, I wouldn't go along with that. I wouldn't yeah. mind to be strange because the original is strange. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, so far as the Because you were saying, I mean, was, weren't you saying that earlier about the, the idea that, you know, it, if it doesn't read like ordinary English, you, you know, and therefore that could be seen to faithfully reflect the fact that it isn't original English. But if the original is sort of in effortless French and it doesn't seem to be strange in that way, yeah, you yeah. know, that it, it, it would, so then yeah. you get something that isn't really English, that, that yeah. sort of well, that's true. conveying maybe yeah. a false impression of what yeah. the original was mm. like, if the original was yeah. um, mm. marked by that. Yeah, I and mean, in a way, it's translating something like Valérie's work is a bit of a gift because it's strange in French. Yeah. So, so you, you've got to find an equivalent strangeness that mm. nevertheless sounds English. Mm. Um, and that's what I was trying to do, I think. Maybe mm. different strategies are appropriate for different poems, and this poem is like an announcement of, of an experience of being in it, and um, mm. unless the translation is an, an enactment of that moment, mm. and it's not going to... It's not going to... No, capture. No, yeah. Capture. But I mean, the last yeah. thing yeah. you can do yeah. is the kind of thing yeah. that was being proposed on that website, sort of going through and, and, and just finding dictionary equivalents, word by word, you know. Mm. No. Yeah. When you end up with a crib, then really. Yeah, don't you, you do. Yeah, yeah. You, you yeah. end up with something like I've written here. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. But you've also translated these. I have, yeah. So you might actually read that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. read your yeah. version. Yeah. 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 It seems a long time ago, right. Um, so the first one My mother takes the photo, then she's 20. You can't see the green runabout to run about in. Always a smile, they cross the little field, they see the first flowers come. They each have a child in their arms. The words they love get said twice over. Sunshine, sunshine on the grass, the grass, you dance, you dance. And then, the sky's up on its pedals, dancing. Sometimes the sun right in your eyes. I take my father's bike, radiant with spokes as if set free. Aluminium frame, the cows take off. Change up on the flat for their hot air bellies. Always spoken freely. Yes. So I did over the coinage, but uh, that's yeah. lovely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, they were they were hard, but they were, mm -hmm. and I don't know. You know, you don't succeed all the time, but but it's certainly hugely satisfying to wrestle with them. And because I was so moved by reading the collection, I don't think I've ever read anything like it. But I really just wanted to try and see if I could reproduce that, that kind of effect in English. But anyway, <laughs> we've had our ups and downs <laughs> of discussion. Um, Can I ask you, Susan, how long did it take you to do the, to do the translation of the collection? Um, how, how many poems was it, Valerie, again? Oh, 78. 78 poems. What, that first one? Probably about two years. But I, I, you know, I rent cottages and go off on my own and 
or I do residences and I, I just and I do them very fast. I do the first draft, you know, maybe three in the morning, quickly while I can sort of hear a voice in my head and then come back over them several times. I in the first draft I don't even do the dictionary, I'll bring in the dictionary the second time. Um, was that, was that two years while doing your other work in between? Did you yeah, say? doing it all at the same time, yeah. Teaching. You could write your own poems and so, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I was, so. at, I was at, at Kent then, I was teaching point five as director of the Centre for Creative Writing at Kent. Um, yes, it was time to go. But a lovely thing to escape into. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, anyway. Um, we'll yeah, we stop there. Yeah, I think so. No, I gave you the other poem, but yeah, you can play with that elsewhere. <laughs> I didn't know how much. How yeah, long no, that's, 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 to go on. that's really good. Thank you. And is there any question? Any final question for uh, for Susan? Yeah, um, did you receive any help to understand the references, like the cultural ones, or for the idioms? Yeah, I did. I mean, there were things I didn't understand that I quizzed you about by email. I can't remember now what they were. Um, but there were plenty of things, yeah, and, and some of the um, literary references I didn't pick up, some of them I did. Um, yeah, is somebody just like sitting uh, next to you that you can chat with or something? I'm sorry, I'm not um, hearing. Like, um, were you doing that instantly with the same person with, with you? Was it, no. speaker, uh, like it was by via email. Only by yeah, we did with, it by with, email. with the yeah. poet who oh, wrote the, the poems. No. Yes, with yeah. Benny. I'd, so I'd, I'd do about twenty of them, maybe or, or fifteen or twenty, and then I send okay. her a batch when they were in about their third or fourth draft. Okay, but nobody else tried to analyze them. No. No, just you. Mm. No, just me. Okay. You would like to read before you even like to read the first your translation, the first poem, or would that spoil it for people who want to translate oh, no. it later? <laughs> God no. <laughs> okay, great. Well, I'd just like to then say thank you very much, Susan, for that really interesting seminar. I think it was very illuminating. It really, I mean, it brings out the, the real difficulty of mm but also your extreme talent <laughs> in managing to, to translate uh, Valérie Rousseau's poems, which are, which are incredibly French. And, you know, I actually try, I try to teach some of Valérie's poems uh, to my students. And um, it is difficult because there are so many cultural references. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a wonderful learning experience for mm -hmm. students, for actually learning the French language. You know, because I was doing a poem the other day that had a line uh, which went, um, C'était au temps où les vaches uh, chantaient et les pies riaient. Mm -hmm. And it's a reference to two things in France. One is cheese, but the cheese yeah. is la vache, la, la, la vache chiri. Chiri. And the other thing is a sweets that they give to children called les, uh, la, pique la, pique la pique qui chante. But Valerie had inverted, so it was the... It's a col col collision. Between the cow the collision and the, between the cow and, and the magpie. The magpie. <laughs> uh, but she, in her poem, she had the, the cow's... Um, singing and the magpies laughing but if you so if you didn't know that it was referring to cheese and it's both it, because it's evoking the world of childhood you know that because it's cheese that you give to children la vache qui rit, and these are sweets you give to children but so you but you'd be reading about cows and magpies no, but this is my golden yeah. age when my dad was it's the golden age of childhood and i, um, I, I said and this time is over when he dies, yeah, when uh, he died. Um, yeah. And uh, I tried to not to remain on the funerals where my mom asked me to 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 create a poem on the occasion for the friends and the family, and uh, I created a, an awful shit poem. But it was just for funerals. But it was not. Daddy dis did not deserve that. But uh, you can't bury someone without words. And since we we know we're not believers. There was no church. We, we, we well, yeah. Uh, so uh, she asked me because I had 
already published collections of poetry. So I did that, but when I got back home, said I can't stay with that awful poem for, for daddy, so I began to write Pavo. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. ah. so yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And you've a little bit of Jacques Brel, isn't it? C'est autant au Bruxelles et Chantel. Oh, maybe. It's, 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 it's full of songs it's and full of every uh, um, cultural references and yeah, slang and idioms. Yeah. And, um, but there's also um, 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 there's Yeats somewhere. Yeats, yeah. So an Irish. And there are the English and American references too. And uh, um, um, the golden apples. Mm -hmm. so oh, it's gold, it's yeah. Yeats. Uh, the golden apples of the sun. sun. The yeah, silver yeah, apples of the, the moon. Yeah, yeah. Because when Dad um, was ill, we were in Ireland. Huh. My husband huh? and I at the time we were in Donegal. Mm -hmm. And I bought the complete works by Yeats at the time, mm -hmm. so I introduced a bit of Yeats mm -hmm. in one poem when my dad yeah. is driving his lorry, and I imagine it's like Le Petit Poussé. Uh, since Tom, we were, Tom, we were Tom, seven Tom. children and he becomes the, the, the child, you know when someone dies you say, il est parti, it's an um, euphemism. Uh, since he was really gone, but you could follow him with the trognon de pommes, Oh, if the golden oh, apples oh. throw the trognon away, oh. and you can, like the stones of the little pussy, Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, it, we, could, we could go on for a long time. Yeah, so but <laughs> can I just say, first of all, congratulations to Valérie Rousseau on writing her amazing poetry, mm -hmm. and congratulations to Susan Wicks for doing these outstanding translations. Thank you both very much. Oh,